back to Student of the Gun Radio. I am your host, Paul Markle. Thanks for joining us today. Now, before we get started, we want to take a moment to thank Keltec Weapons of Cocoa, Florida, and Crossbreed Holsters for supporting the show. If you've been paying attention this week, you may have, or then again, you may not have seen the story out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where an armed citizen with a concealed carry permit rescued a police officer. Now, the reason I say you may not have seen it is because I just recently found out about it. It actually happened on Friday, last Friday last. I believe it was 3, 7, 10, whatever. Whatever the first Friday of March was, it occurred in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Now, you say, uh, I Googled it, and there's one official news story from WAFB out of Baton Rouge. Now, you would think... If a citizen with a concealed carry permit came to the aid of a police officer and had to stop a felon from killing that police officer, that it would be national news. Now, certainly, if a citizen with a concealed carry permit shot a police officer, it would be everywhere. It would be on CNN and MSNBC and you name it. You wouldn't. There would be Sunday morning shows dedicated to it. But here we are. We have an armed good guy, and the armed good guy was named Mr. Perry Stevens. Thank you, Mr. Perry Stevens, for saving that officer's life. An armed good guy comes to the aid of a police officer and has to shoot and kill a felon who's in the process of killing a police officer. And if you Google it, there's the top search is WAFB, and all the other ones are essentially pro-Second Amendment gun sites pro-Second Amendment websites. But what can we learn from this situation? Now, as a student of the gun, as a dedicated student, you should understand that you can learn from your own experiences, but you should also learn from the experiences of others because other people's experiences are less costly. Now, paying attention, we we get a lot of lessons from this particular incident. Number one, it occurred, uh, how it began was actually the police officer in question Uh, Mr. Officer Brian Harrison was escorting a funeral procession on Friday, and he pulled over the suspect, Mr. George Temple, and wrote him a ticket for breaking into the procession. He broke into the funeral procession. Okay. Uh, Not a huge deal. You know, take your ticket and leave. Well, instead of taking his ticket and leaving, uh, Temple turned on Officer Harrison and attacked him. And keep in mind, this wasn't... 2 a.m. on a Friday night. This wasn't outside of a bar in the bad part of town. This was in the middle of the day, the middle of a Friday during a funeral procession. Now, how many of you out there have concealed carry permits? And how many of you only carry when you think you'll need it? I know, if, and if you're not one of those guys, you probably know one of those guys or girls that does that. They've got their permit, they've got their gun, but they only carry when they think they might need it. And when is that? Well, you know, at night or when I'm going to a bad part of the town or what have you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's, first of all, if you're going to be a concealed carry holder, if you're going to be armed, you need to be armed whenever it is humanly possible for you to do so. Because carrying your concealed carry pistol sometimes or only when you think you might need it is rolling the dice, is gambling. And we don't want to gamble with our lives. So that's number one. I guess lesson number one is bad things can and do happen any time of the day or night. You don't get to choose. Unless you are the actor, unless you are the instigator, you don't get to choose when the bad guy arrives. And when you move around in the world, we can't sterilize the world. You walk into a gas station, a grocery store, you name it, you don't know who's coming in there. Heck, in the uh, town that I live in, Biloxi, Mississippi, uh, in the middle of, I think it was what, Jared? It was before noon, wasn't it? It was early in the morning at a Winn-Dixie grocery store. People are shopping on a Wednesday morning, just having a good time. Here comes an estranged husband with a shotgun, walks into the store and takes hostages. How many of you think that when you go grocery shopping, you should take your gun? How many of you talk yourself out of carrying a gun because you think, Well, I'm just going to the grocery store. I won't need one there. It's not about you. You People think, well, it's it's, everyone thinks that that everything that happens is, well, I'm a good person and I don't mess with anyone. So so no one's certainly going to mess with me. It's not about you. It's not the bullet with your name on it. It's the one that says to whom it may concern. 
So first, first lesson learned for students of the gun is bad things and bad people are everywhere. You cannot sterilize the world. Number two, okay, this police officer was attacked. Now, thank the Lord that uh, Mr. Stevens actually had the courage to act, to do something, not to just stand there and stare, not to, you know, and they said, well, call 911. Okay, help is on its way, but help isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to do any good in the next 15 seconds. If someone is smashing your head into the asphalt of a parking lot and they say, hold on, the police will be here in five minutes, how long do you want to lay on the asphalt and let someone bounce your head off of it? Three minutes, four minutes? I think more than two seconds is too long. <laughs> it doesn't matter if help is on the way eventually. It's who is here now to help. Can you help right now? Do you have the fortitude and the courage to actually help right now? Now, I'm, I'm going to have to ding Mr. Stevens real quickly here because Mr. Stevens, even though he has a concealed carry permit, it said in the story, now I'm just quoting from the story, I haven't interviewed anybody in here, but it said he had to return to his car, grab his 45 caliber pistol, and run to the aid of the officer. Okay, so he had his gun. It probably would have, uh, <laughs> the officer would have taken just a little bit less damage if Mr. Stevens would have actually had it on him. That is lesson number two. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to be an armed citizen, carry your gun on yourself, on your person. Uh, people who lock them in their glove compartments or stick them underneath the seat or what have you. And you say, well, but I go to places where they won't let me carry. You know what I say to that? Don't go to those places. Or if you can avoid it, go somewhere else. People say, well, I got to go to the bank, right? Does your bank have a drive through window? If your bank has a drive through window, use it and don't go in the lobby. Use the ATM instead. How about businesses? How about your, uh, your local, whatever they are, restaurants, pharmacies, you know, electronic stores, what does not matter? If they have a sign on the door that, said no, that says no concealed carry permits allowed, you know what I do? I frequent somewhere else because that's bologna sausage. Do you really believe that bad guys are going to see the little shiny placard on the door and think, oh, man, I was going to go in here and commit a felony and uh, I saw the shiny sign and I decided to go somewhere else. It's bull crap. The only thing that those little shiny placards do is they disarm the good guys and leave them helpless. If, folks, it's 2013. And if we haven't figured out as a society by now that gun-free zones are essentially criminal protection areas, I, I don't know if we're ever going to learn it. The uh, Winn-Dixie incident that uh, I spoke of earlier just a little bit ago, that actually happened in a store that had a shiny placard. They had the little sticker thing on the door that said, no concealed carry, no uh, handguns allowed on the premises. Didn't stop the estranged husband from walking in with a pistol and a shotgun and taking hostages. Apparently, he missed the sign on the way in. Uh, but getting back to the Baton Rouge, Louisiana thing. So what happened? Well, the officer was struggling. Uh, the Mr. Mr. Temple was on him and apparently was bouncing his head off the ground. The officer told him to stop, 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 pulled out his gun and actually shot Mr. Temple. And according to the story, he shot him four times in the abdomen and torso area. He continued to try and kill him. The, uh, our, the hero of our story, Mr. Stevens, arrived, ordered Mr. Temple to stop, and he didn't because that's what bad people do. <laughs> when bad people are in the middle of killing you, generally they don't stop when you give them the verbal command to stop because they're already in the process of doing their bad stuff and they're just going to keep on doing it. So what did our hero do? Well, he fired. He shot it, shot Mr. Temple through the head, ironically enough, and Mr. Temple stopped trying to kill the police officer and expired. Yay, team. Good on him. So uh, since this has been published, uh, a lot of my Facebook friends and the people in the, uh, in the gun world, the pro-Second Amendment world, have... And the only reason you may know about this is because of the pro-Second Amendment press. If you're waiting for CNN or MSNBC or the Huffington Post or God knows who, the New York Times, if you're waiting for them to clue you in when a good guy does something, you know, positive, 
you're going to be waiting a long, long time. It's just not going to happen. Or what they'll do is they'll mention it one time, they'll do the obligatory mention, and then they'll never speak of it again. Again, if I, I cannot, I don't, I believe that if you're listening to the sound of my voice, you're on, you're on the right team, or at least you're in the right frame of mind, and you know that if it was a, a, a lawfully armed citizen that did something bad, somebody with a concealed carry permit did something bad, they would talk about it for weeks and how terrible it is and how we need to rescind people's permits and we need to look closer at who we're giving guns to and blah, 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 blah. But a good guy does something, it's like, oh, well, moving on to the next story. Before we progress, I need to take a real quick moment for clarification. And the uh, problem you run into when you're on the radio and you start talking about numbers, numbers of anything, things get jumbled together. Uh, the story reported that the officer fired at least one round and that uh, Mr. Perry came up and fired more than one round into the uh, suspect's torso area. So when before he got shot in the head, Mr. Temple was shot multiple times in the torso area and he continued to do what he was doing. So uh, a lot of folks have posted comments on the internet and you know Facebook and what have you about, well, obviously this felon, this Temple, he had to be on drugs. He had to be hopped up on the old <laughs> hopped up on PCP. He had to be hopped up on drugs uh, because nobody could take five hits from a handgun and keep going. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury and uh, everyone else who's uh, interested, handguns are f carried for convenience. That is why we carry handguns. We carry handguns because if you go into the local grocery store with a Remington 870 or an M4 over your shoulder, they get a little bit excited. People tinkle down their legs and they call the police. So what do we do? We carry handguns because they're easy to conceal, they're lightweight, and they leave two hands free. Handguns are for convenience. Rifles are for effectiveness or long guns. If you want to actually make people stop, you need to use a long gun. Uh, a good uh, my my firearms mentor, my personal firearms mentor, John Farnham. I took a John Farnham course in 1986. It was my first official firearms training, and I'm very grateful for that. But John has been saying for decades when he teaches his courses, he'll ask his students, he'll say, "What do people do after you shoot them with a handgun?" And he'll wait and pause, and, and people, you know, they they come up with they postulate answers, and he says the same thing they were doing before you shot them with a handgun. <laughs> Excuse me while I pause to take a sip of my Monster Rehab tea. Monster Rehab, it's awesome. <laughs> They're not really a sponsor of the show, but I like Monster Rehab tea. But uh, getting back to the point, John says he, he wants people to understand that handguns are very, very ineffective killing tools. You say, well, oh, that's bullcrap. I know people have been shot with handguns and died. Well, yes, people have been shot with handguns and died. People fall off ladders. You know, people, <laughs> you know, cut themselves with chainsaws or whatever and die. That doesn't mean it's effective. It doesn't mean it's an effective way of making people expire. Now, the truth is that we don't shoot people in self-defense to make them expire. We shoot them to make them stop doing the felonious, deadly force behavior that they're currently engaged in. That's why we shoot them. But don't expect miracles. People who, uh, and it, it's everyone, everyone in America grew up watching television shows and movies. And in the movies, when people are shot with handguns, they fly across the room, they fall over chairs. I mean, it, it's not quite as bad as it was when we were growing up. You know, every, every cowboy movie, a guy got shot with a six shooter and, you know, flew backwards through the saloon window. And that's what you were trained. If you never carried a gun for a living, if you've never been involved in a violent physical confrontation, if all you've got is TV and Hollywood to base your reality upon, that becomes your reality. And you assume that when you shoot someone that they're going to burst into flames, you know, that they're, they're going to double over and backflip. The truth is most people that are shot with handguns in the United States of America don't die. At somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to 85% of all people shot with handguns live. They just keep right on going. They go to the hospital, they fix them, and they drive on. So 
killing people with handguns is an almost or it's kind of a, an accident. Now, long guns are effective. You know, you said, now we don't want to kill people. No, it's to make them stop. Now, how do you make a human being who is intent on doing serious harm to you or someone else? How do you quick, fast and in a hurry make that person stop? Well, there's two ways. Number one, you launch bullets into that person and you interrupt their central nervous system. Now, the central nervous system obviously is composed of the, you know, the spine and the brain. If you can interrupt the signals that the brain is given to the body, doesn't matter how much PCP or crack or dope or whatever they're on, if the brain can't send the signal to the body, the body's not working. It's done. Okay. Let's, we, and we understand that. And the other way is to puncture enough holes in it that you lose fluid. It's like uh, it's the, uh, the old holes in the radiator. Now, if your radiator, if you're driving 55 miles an hour down the highway and your radiator springs a leak, does the car stop? Does it skid to a halt? No, it stops eventually. It keeps going. It's not going to you know, drive you all the way to Miami, but it's not going to stop right there. It's moving. And it's going to keep on moving for a while. That's the way human beings are when you poke holes in them. You puncture a human being and, and they start leaking, they're not going to stop immediately physiologically. Now, psychologically, now if you were driving down the road and all of a sudden steam comes out of your, uh, you know, starts coming out of from underneath the hood, well, what do you do? You jam on the brakes and you pull off to the side. Well, did you pull off to the side because you wanted to? or because the car wouldn't go any farther. Well, you did because you wanted to. You're like, well, this is not good. I need to get off the road. Stop. Well, bad guys are the same way. Some bad guys, and when I was teaching, uh, the, I, I teach a lot of armed living uh, or concealed carry classes, and I talk to people about what to expect, you know, mom and pop, you know, brothers and sisters, people that aren't professional cops. They're not combat Marines. Uh, they haven't, you know, uh, heard and fired shots in anger. They're just people, uh, but people need to be protected. And I so said there are three basic kinds of bad people or villains in the world that you will potentially encounter. Now, the level one or the number one is someone who, when you present force, when you present them with the threat of force, they're about to harm you, they're going to rob you, rape you, whatever, and you produce a firearm. They see the firearm and they're like, hmm, this just stopped being fun. I need to go find someone else. And they leave. They stop trying to harm you. Most people say, oh, they'll surrender. Like, No, most bad guys, they're not going to just stop. They're, they're going to run. They're going to try and get away as quickly as possible. Let them go. Don't chase them. You're not a police officer. So the good news is that about somewhere from 80 to 90% of all your bad guys, all the bad guys you're going to encounter are level one and that is, but that's a psychological stop. You point a gun at a bad guy and he says, Whoa, I'm sorry. I'm going to go find an unarmed victim. And he runs away. He didn't stop because your gun did something physical to him. He made the conscious decision. I'm not going to keep trying to attack you. Okay. That's number one. Number two, number two is when a, a bad guy is attacking you. And even though you have the gun and you use the gun, they're not going to stop until they in, or receive some type of physical damage to their body. Now, it could be as simple as a bullet through the upper arm or leg or, you know, through their lung. Now, you know that you have two lungs and you can live with only one, right? If, a per, if they are injured, if they receive physical injury of some sort, even though it may not be life-threatening, that person, they're like, whoa, this is no fun anymore. I'm going to stop and I'm going to go do something else. This guy's serious. He's actually going to fight back. And as a bad guy, I don't like that. Well, that's your level two. And that takes you up to about 99%. So your first two felons or bad guys, uh, if you present a firearm and you are determined to actually use that firearm in your own defense, don't try and bluff bad guys because you cannot do it. Uh, if you're determined to use it, if you either use it and they're injured, yet they will still survive, then you're good. Go team. You win. Now, the last one is a level three. And, and fortunately for you out there in the audience, fortunately for you and me and, and all of my family members and friends, 
the level three is less than it's one to less than one percent. But these are the bad guys that they're so hardened, their brains are so twisted and poisoned and nasty that they don't care. They will not notice. They're going to keep doing the bad, mean, evil stuff until they are, they, their brains are, uh, are no longer able to function. Until you interrupt the central nervous system. Until you shut them down. A great example of that, and if you're a younger whippersnapper in the audience, like uh, my production engineer Jared there, you probably don't remember the 1986 Miami shootout with Platt and Maddox. Now, if you, I'm going to give you guys a, a homework assignment. All right, you students out there. I know it's only the second episode and I'm giving you homework already, but just deal with it. Uh, Platt and Maddox were bad, bad men. They, were, they robbed banks. They robbed armored cars. They carried big guns, and they did not hesitate at a moment's notice to use those guns. If you blinked at them wrong, they shot you. They were bad actors. And the FBI decided we need to find these bad actors that are knocking over these banks and armored cars and what have you, and we need to bring them to justice. So they set out to find them. Well, guess what? They found them. Almost immediately, which is never happens, but it did that day. And they exchanged lots and lots of gunfire. Copious amounts of gunfire was exchanged between the two bad guys. Uh, between Platt and Maddox, they suffered multiple gunshot wounds. Uh, I believe it was Platt who received the first chest wound. He received a non-survivable wound to the chest. Now, what is a non-survivable wound? Well, it's simply this. He was wounded to the point where the bullet entered his chest cavity and it stopped right at his heart and it damaged the blood vessels that lead to the heart and out of the heart. He was going to bleed to death. He was a dead man walking, literally. He just did not know it yet. Even after receiving a life-threatening or a deadly wound in the beginning of the fight, he kept going fired his rifle, I believe it was 45, don't hold me to the numbers, but it's something like 45 more times and lived for another two to three minutes. Say, oh, two to three minutes, that's pretty short. <laughs> you know how much damage a bad man with a gun can do in three minutes? Well, in this case, he murdered two FBI agents and wounded five with a life-threatening wound. Maddox took a, a initially a round to his head, which caused him to go unconscious for a short amount of time. Then he got out of the car. Both Platt and Maddox left their vehicle, entered an FBI vehicle, and attempted to escape the scene after murdering two agents and wounding five. It was Ed Morales who has huevos that come in a freaking wheelbarrow after receiving a grievous wound to his left arm. Ed Morales, Special Agent Edmundo Morales, uh, he got up, used his 357 Magnum revolver, and he walked right up to Platt and Maddox, and he ended the fight by putting rounds in their face and head area. And it wasn't until he did that that the fight was over. Uh, I highly recommend, if you're a true student of the gun, that you examine the FBI Miami shootout. And you say, well, what's the big deal, Paul? Why are you bringing this all up? Well, after it was over, people postulated, oh, they were on painkillers, PCP, whatever. Nope. Toxicology reported zero drugs on board. They were operating on pure adrenaline and hate. And that's the way the human animal is. If you encounter a level three, he's just going to keep going and he's going to do whatever he wants to do, even though he's a dead man walking, until you physiologically shut him down. Now, if, if the hair standing up on the back of your neck, good. Well, the good news is less than 1% of the bad guys you encounter will be that hardcore. Here's the bad news. When the bad guy comes into your area of operation and starts doing his bad stuff, you don't know. You won't know until it's over whether or not he's a level 1, a level 2, or a level 3. We hope that we'll encounter the level 1. We have to plan for a level 3. If your defensive plan is simply, I'm going to pull out my gun and point at them and they will run away, what happens when they don't? Where's your plan then? You need to understand that. And, uh, you know, it's like going back to Mr. Temple here in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Mr. Temple wasn't going to stop. 
he was a level three. He'd been shot by the police officer multiple times. And now I don't know about the toxicology on Mr. Temple. The report hasn't come back yet. But what I do know is that human beings, bad human beings, can and do operate on pure hate and adrenaline. It doesn't have to be PCP or crack cocaine or whatever. And when they decide they're just going to keep on killing until you physiologically make them stop, you better understand that human beings don't burst into flames when you shoot them with handguns. It, it just doesn't happen. And uh, a lot of combat veterans uh, will, can attest to the fact that you know they uh, have shot at people or police veterans as well, shot at human beings, shot bad people. And you know that was the first time they shot a bad person. They put the sights on them, pressed the trigger. They're sure they struck them, but they kept going, kept running, kept dodging, kept hiding, kept returning fire. And uh, I talked to uh, a good friend of mine. He said the first time he shot a guy with the uh, an M16 loaded with the green tip uh, ball ammunition that we issue our troops now. He said, I shot that guy and I knew I hit him, but he kept running. And I shot him again. He, I shot again and again. He said, I had to shoot him seven times with that green tip ammo before he stopped. Well, that's because green tip is designed to go through Soviet body armor. It's not designed as a good killing machine. But uh, I digress. The fact is, is don't expect instantaneous results. That's not the way it works in the world. If you do get instantaneous results, great. Then, you know, they've decided, oh, here's a good guy with a gun. I'm going to stop and go somewhere else. Fantastic. Go team. And that's what we want to happen. Uh, the, the old analogy is this. When you stick someone in the butt with a pin and they jump, they go, ouch, and they jump. Did they jump and move forward because the force of the pin propelled them forward? Or is it because their reaction to the pin? Well, obviously, it was a reaction to the pin. And if someone stands now, if I walked up behind you and you didn't know I was there and I stuck you in the fanny with a pin, what would you do? You'd yell and jump, right? How many times have you gone to the doctor and they've used an even bigger pin in the form of a hypodermic needle to take your blood? You sat there in that chair, and even though you might have had to grit your teeth and turn away, you held your body perfectly still while they drew your blood, right? Same, same concept. You decided purposely not to jump, not to run, not to scream when that big nasty needle was poked into your arm. But if you didn't know it was coming and I walked up and I poked you with it, you'd jump and you'd scream. Think about it like that. All right, we talked about some serious stuff. Now, what do we learn from that lesson? Number one, bad things can and do happen at any time. Do not deceive yourself into the, well, I'm only going to carry when I think I'm going to need it. Because when you think you need it, is not it's not up to you. It's up to the bad guy. All right? We can't sterilize the world. If you're out in public, you're going to be exposed to potential danger. That's just the way the world is. Number two, uh, if you're going if you're going to carry, carry. Actually, have your gun on you. And if if your favorite restaurant or your favorite grocery store, or whatever, decides that it's a good idea to put up those silly, ridiculous, shiny placards on their door to try and disarm you, the good guy. I wouldn't go there. I'd give my money to somewhere else. And I would let them know. I'd say, hey, I was going to spend some money here in your store, but since you think it's a good idea to disarm the good guys while leaving the bad guys armed, I'm going to go to your competitors and I'm going to give them my money. So have a nice day. Uh, handgun bullets are care. I like to say handgun bullets annoy, rifle bullets kill. Do not expect someone who is shot with a handgun to burst into flames and to instantly cease their bad behavior. They may not. Human beings operated on pure adrenaline and hate can take a lot of handgun bullets before they stop misbehaving. And you need to understand that. You need to have a plan and be prepared for it. Now, uh, the story here on WAFB, if you want to find it, that's where it is right now. Just Google uh, bystander fires deadly shot, not officer or citizen rescues police officer. And uh, Mr. Stevens, good on you. You are a hero in my book. I don't care. Uh, the, uh, the law enforcement agents and, or the spokesman for the local law enforcement agencies referred to it as an unfortunate incident and, let me see, a tragedy? It was tragedy. Uh, I don't see a good guy saving a police officer's life as an unfortunate. You know, the unfortunate incident was started by the bad guy. 
the fortunate incident was finished by the good guy. Okay. And, uh, I, I say go team. More good guys, less bad guys. That's always a good thing in the world. But let's talk. We talked about serious stuff. Let's talk about stuff that's not quite so serious. Let's talk about something uh, fun or interesting. Our friends at Crossbreed Holsters are working with my friend Jim Wilson, and they've come up with the Liberty Cross Western Holster. That's right. It's a Western holster designed for an 1873 single action pistol. And they're making a limited edition of them right now. And every one of them will bear the signature of Sheriff Jim Wilson. I know Sheriff Jim Wilson. He is a gentleman, if there ever was a gentleman. He's a true Western gentleman. And he's been in the game long enough now to know a lot of the original players. Uh, you know, Bill or Jim Wilson uh, knew Bill Jordan. And he knew a lot of the old uh, Border Patrol agents and Western sheriffs. He is kind of a walking encyclopedia of Western law enforcement knowledge. And if you ever get a chance to meet Jim uh, at a trade show or NRA or what have you, I, I would highly suggest that you, you shake the man's hand and, and say hello. And he's probably going to be like, stop sending people to shake my hand, Paul. I got stuff to do. But, <laughs> but Jim is a true gentleman, and he will definitely shake your hand and say hello to you. And if you would like a Liberty Cross holster from Crossbreed, all you have to do is go to crossbreedholsters.com. Like I said, uh, uh, they're only making a, a limited number of these, and uh, all of them, it's a single-action revolver holster. Uh, all of them will bear Jim Wilson's signature on them. So if you've got the opportunity or if you're interested, take advantage of it now because they're not going to be around forever. Now, as you know, our buddies at Keltec, they're pretty famous for making polymer-framed guns and inexpensive or affordable guns. Now, they moved into some more expensive guns with the RFB rifle and uh, the KSG 12-gauge shotgun. But what a lot of you may not know is Keltec is now making flashlights. And you're like, what? Keltec is making flashlights? Well, they're a machine company. Yeah, they, they, they machine stuff. And uh, what they decided to do is like, you know what? I bet you we can make a very bright, compact flashlight. And that's exactly what they did. They actually came up with two flashlights, the CL42, which looks kind of standard, is a standard cylindrical. It has a tail cap switch and a, and a belt clip, and it is a very bright LED light. I've got one of them. It's a solid piece of equipment. And then they have the CL43, which is actually designed to be used in your support hand as you are holding a pistol. When you hold a pistol in your normal grip, you can hold the CL43 and the activator switch is in a little different place. You can actually activate it with the middle finger of your support hand. It's kind of a unique design, but in, in practice, it works very well. Now, these aren't cheap lights. Uh, you're not going to get them for five bucks, but ladies and gentlemen, you don't want a $5 flashlight if you're going to be using it to potentially save your life. Now, people say, well, I'm not going to save my life with a flashlight. A flashlight's gonna stop, not going to stop a bad guy. You know what a flashlight's going to do? It's going to stop you potentially from going to prison. How much of your life do you spend in the dark? About half. You go inside a building and the power goes out and there's no windows. Where are you? You're in the dark. Now, if you have to use your handgun, if you need to use a firearm to defend your life, what's rule four? Know your target, what's around it, and what's beyond it. We don't shoot at sounds. We don't shoot at scary sounds or shadows, right? We only can shoot at things that we have identified as an actual and genuine threat. And if you shoot something that shouldn't have been shot, a person that should not have been shot, you're going to have to live with that for the rest of your life. Now, how do we make sure that we're shooting the right things in the dark? Well, we use a flashlight. We use a bright white light. And people are like, I'm not spending no $30 for a light or 40 or 60 or whatever. That's bull crap. I can get this one from the gas station for $5. You know what? If you shoot someone that shouldn't have been shot, $5 is nothing. Start racking up the thousands upon thousands of dollars in attorney fees and fines and so forth to get yourself out of trouble if you shoot someone that should not have been shot. A $60 flashlight will seem like a bargain if you ever have an, a negligent shooting or mistaken identity shooting. So spend the money. Spend the money on a good quality flashlight. Carry it every day. You won't regret it.
And if you want to find out more about the kel lights, you can simply go to kel Well, ladies and gentlemen and children of all ages, I certainly appreciate you stopping by. I hope that uh, a lot of you are subscribing to the show on iTunes now. Um, Thank you for stopping by the website. Now, you can always go to studentofthegun.com, and you can check out our gear store. If you want cool stuff like Student of the Gun T-shirts or DVDs, uh, your, your host, yours truly, wrote a book called Student of the Gun. A Beginner Once, A Student for Life. And if you'd like an autographed copy of that, all you have to do is go to studentofthegun.com, click on that little picture of the book right there, and you can order one for your very own, and we'll get it right out to you. Now, we want to also thank Madison Rising for giving us permission to use their awesome rock and roll and music on our show. If you have the opportunity, go over to madisonrising.com, check out their CDs, their tour dates, and all that good stuff. They are pro-amendment rock and rollers. No PC garbage from Madison Rising. So until next time, remember, if you are a student of the gun, you're a beginner once, but you should be a student for life. 